Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. Have you heard about STEM? S-T-E-M. It's an acronym, and it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. It, the idea behind this is to use an interdisciplinary uh, approach rather than teaching them as four separate subjects. But according to the United States Department of Education, there aren't many students who are opting for um, STEM fields. And some people are worried about that. They think that STEM, science, technology, education, um, um, engineering, and math, that they are going to determine the future for the United States. Well, we're going to talk about it today, and I'm excited to welcome my guest, the United States Representative, the Honorable Joseph P. Kennedy III. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, before we talk about STEM, how did you get so involved and so interested in this whole focus on STEM? Well, it's, um, it's been an interest to me for a while, uh, Naja. So I, um, my undergraduate degree was actually in engineering. It was essentially industrial engineering. It was uh, where I was at school. It was called management science and engineering. So uh, a number of my classmates and my colleagues, the class of the courses, the folks that I was taking classes with were very involved in computer science. They were entrepreneurs. They were starting new companies and working at some of the uh, best companies out there. And to see um, them build up a skill set that they could then transfer into a whole wide variety of fields, whether that was uh, medical and becoming doctors, whether it was uh, folks that were going to go work in, in banking and finance, whether it was folks that were starting up little companies uh, and, and going to work for firms like now, Facebook and Google and others, it seemed uh, it was a field that if you have a proficiency in science and technology and engineering and math, certainly you have the flexibility to go do a whole lot of things. And so uh, part of it was my own uh, experience, my own education. Part of it was um, looking at some of the strengths of Massachusetts and in particular the 4th District, the, the uh, district that I represent, um, the history of the district, the history of the, that Massachusetts has in manufacturing fields and in uh, what used to be old industrial manufacturing and our new innovations around precision manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, our biotech and life sciences communities here. Uh, I'm also very focused on economic opportunity, so trying to, if we, we look very carefully at uh, looking at what Massachusetts does well and our competitive advantages here and try to understand about how we can actually build on this going forward, mm -hmm. trying to make sure we have a pathway for uh, middle class jobs here. STEM, I think, is right at the heart of it. Well, you know what's interesting? I'm listening carefully to you and all of these, um, these jobs, mm -hmm. opportunities that you're talking about, um, that are now driving STEM. Mm -hmm. But what's happened to the basics? Um, years ago, not too long ago, we were all concerned about people being able to read well. I'm a mm -hmm. retired reading specialist, Absolutely. so I'm, you know, this is kind of in the back of my mind. We were very concerned about basic math skills, reading and writing. So is there something in particular, given all this background that you've said, that's driving STEM as opposed to almost reading and writing and humanities. Well, I think so. There's uh, the focus on STEM is looking at uh, very carefully again at some of the, the the jobs and the careers today and trying to look into the future and say, one, yeah, as we try to get our economy moving again, it's coming out of the depths of a, a very mm -hmm, uh, difficult mm -hmm. recession. Where are those jobs? What are those fields? What are those skills that are necessary in order to uh, to um, get our, our economy moving in and start to build out that middle class again. Two, into the future, what are those uh, areas that are most um, exciting, the most ability, that have the biggest ability to innovate, where there's the most uh, potential and opportunity going forward? And that's not to say that you're not going to be, you don't have to have a, a strong proficiency in reading. That's not to say the liberal arts education isn't uh, an extremely important part mm -hmm. uh, to a broad-based education that's going to be uh, driving parts of this uh, our economy going forward and basic mm -hmm. aptitude. In fact, uh, the arts, I think, play an important part to the innovation and imagination that also drives uh, mm -hmm. the engineering around STEM as well. I'd like to talk um, yeah. a little more about the arts as okay. we go along. Um, recently, Southeastern Mass, and you, mm -hmm. as you've said, Massachusetts is kind of a leader in this kind of um, professional world with STEM. But they had a southeastern region mm -hmm. from Quincy to the Cape. They had a huge resource fair. I think Nick Clemens from your office was there on one of the panels. And I was wor uh, 
moderating a panel on uh, the arts in mm -hmm. STEM. But I wondered if you, if this is all right with you, I'd like to take each one of the goals and just speak briefly about yeah. each one. Now I know someone mentioned to me earlier that they have been somewhat revised and updated, but mm -hmm. the content's pretty much the same. Yeah. So I'll, I'll use the goals as they were presented at the Southeastern Resource Great. Fair. The first one was to increase student interest in STEM. Mm -hmm. Now in your years of visiting schools and um, reading reports, what kinds of things have you seen or learned about that are trying to get kids interested? This is one of the biggest challenges we face. And I think part of it is, I mean, even when I go back to uh, learning uh, my experiences in, in elementary school and middle school and high school, mm -hmm. when something is pitched as, oh gosh, I have to go to science class again or I have to learn about physics, some of those subjects are really hard and it was hard to understand how some of those subjects actually translated to mm -hmm. real world skills or why it was important. So I've gone and visited, as you said, a number of uh, schools now, elementary schools, uh, vocational schools, high schools and colleges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we face is igniting a passion around mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering and math. But when you walk into these classrooms and you see uh, elementary school students learning about uh, engaging in contests about who can build out of materials on a table, who can build a wind turbine, and who can build one that's going to generate the most energy given some of the materials that are there at your fingertips and have a competition with your other classmates. It gets kids excited about that's learning. That's engineering. It's isn't engineering, it? it's, it's math, mathematics, it's physics, it's a whole bunch of yes, different uh, yes. aspects, but the students don't necessarily know that those are the different pieces that they're putting together. They, the project in question was a, an amazing one for seventh and eighth graders um, at a, a middle school that I went to where they were given a bunch of different materials and a budget and they had an associated cost with the material. So not only were they trying to build a wind turbine, but they had to do it underneath budget constraints, which was an, actually a very complex problem for elementary school and middle school students to be dealing with, but one that uh, taught them about a number of different aspects of uh, real world budgeting, about the, again the, the physics, the science behind it, without doing it overtly, uh, but mm -hmm. found ways to get kids excited and engaged in a learning process. Mm -hmm. And the next time they actually drive by a windmill or a wind turbine, they'll have some basic understanding about how it works, why it works, and, and what the it's purpose kind, is going forward. It's kind forward. of inductive learning rather than deductive, where you're just Absolutely. this, you sit there and learn these principles, learn these names, but it's from the hands on and up. That sounds exciting. Well, and so uh, it's exactly right, and it's the critical observation, I think, about part of our, our STEM education going forward is learning by doing and hands-on education, mm -hmm. getting students involved and in obviously not just wind turbines but uh, computer programming, uh, programming for apps. We have an app contest. Oh, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. I read about that. I thought that was pretty clever. It's called the House STEM App Contest. Yeah. Tell me about that. So we uh, were working with an, the idea of a couple of my colleagues in, in Congress. There's a, uh, an art competition every year. Um, that every congressional district holds and the winner from each congressional district their artwork goes up in the capitol in the base or in the tunnels that link some of the house buildings to the US Capitol so every time we run over to go vote there those pictures paintings art uh, is hanging on the walls which is a really nice thing to be able to you look at when you're running back and forth between the tunnel. Reminds you that to connect to the folks back home. Yes, it does. When you're going to vote. And it's a long <laughs> white wall, so it's a pretty drab uh, building. Yes. And, and when you, uh, or that part of it is, a, it could use some decorating, which is why when those paintings are up and the pictures are up, it's, it makes it much more interesting mm -hmm. to be running back and forth. So the idea, though, was, it, and it's also a celebration of some of the artistic talent and ability that's out there from mm -hmm. all across the mm -hmm. country. The idea for the app contest was really off of that model and to say, hey, is there, um, given uh, the now the, the prevalence of smartphones across our, mm -hmm, our country, mm -hmm. the innovation that's coming up with uh, new apps literally day by day, it's a great way to involve and engage particularly young people, uh, high school students, with uh, a way to highlight their ability and see what innovation can come out of it. And so s modeled after that, there's a house, a congressional now, house app contest that uh, is spread out to every congressional district if they w wanted to engage in it. Um, and we did, and we've had some fantastic um, mm -hmm. uh, responses. And, and one of the, I think last time I checked, uh, one of the highest rates of response of any district in the country. So kids are really, really excited about it. And that was part of the idea as well. Well, part of that was your excitement too, along with well, where, where we live at the same time. Um, yes, that, that's very interesting to me. Um, now, I just want to quickly move to the 
two other goals. Yeah. They were called two and five at this resource center. They may be slightly different mm -hmm. today. But goal two said to increase the STEM achievement and no, we no longer say elementary and high, it's pre-K, mm -hmm. before kids go to kindergarten through 12. And number five was to increase the number or the percentage of teachers mm -hmm. who are qualified. We've always had this problem yeah. about teachers who don't know math having to teach a math mm -hmm. class. But now, how are we supporting schools so that we can get better achievement and at the same time supporting our teachers. Well so it's it, these are two uh, critical components to it so one well, let's take the teacher part first. Okay. Yeah. It's looking at some of the challenges that teachers are facing trying to make sure they've got the access to the training programs that they need the support systems that they need and a fluency obviously with the material to make sure that they are comfortable in, in teaching the kids at whatever grade level they're, that they're going across. That is one big job um, right there. It is a big job yes. but um, we yes. found teachers that are um, you, 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 as as we've gone through the process and as the, the STEM Council, the group the, uh, that has been responsible for building up these goals and, and uh, have had literally um, you know, hundreds of conversations with folks across the state and as they build up these goals and flush them out, have had conversations with educators, have had conversations with um, the students and families and everybody else trying to make sure that these goals were really specific to make sure that um, as we try to build up that student achievement, students are only going to achieve if they're getting the, the resources and the support that they need from teachers, but that means that you got to make sure you're supporting the teachers. From the student's perspective, we want to make sure that there's an aptitude there so that they're learning these, uh, this skill set. Uh, as you, you know, when you talk to educators in higher ed and even from the uh, employers that are out there, Many of them will say, uh, if you're looking at an employer that's looking for somebody that's coming straight out of, a, uh, of high school, they don't have the aptitude that we need in order to get this person right into a job. You talk to some folks that run community colleges, many of them will say that particularly in math, they have to do remedial education in order to bring people up, those students up to the mm -hmm, level mm -hmm. that, where they can actually engage in their program. So they spend sometimes over a year in doing that remedial education about the education that they're supposed to have gotten and should have gotten at the elementary school level and at the high school level. So trying to make sure that we are looking at this as a continuum and that the, the underlying skill set is strong and solid and reinforced and that uh, we're supporting students so that they finish their, uh, they come out of the um, K through 12 system with a strong foundation in these skills so that they can go off to uh, and feel well prepared to go off to college or to go right into the workforce. And that the student, the teachers there are feeling, getting the support that they need as well to make sure that they're, they have the ability to educate those students. Well, those are very, very large and lofty and wonderful goals. You know, I taught for 30 years and I'm still in touch and I have triple grandchildren in school. <laughs> And um, it, it sounds wonderful, and it is wonderful. Um, there are some questions I have about yeah. it, though. And so I think um, we do have to go to a break. So I, okay. I, the two things maybe we could talk about when you come back, when we come back, is um, what about this? There is a divide. Mm -hmm. There are students who do not have computers mm -hmm. in their homes, in their schools. And teachers also, um, some of them have access to very high level um, professional development. Mm -hmm. And some of them, depending on if it's a poverty area, often you get drawing people who couldn't get the job in the high paying community. So in the real world, I'm just concerned about whether um, how we are going to bring STEM to poverty areas and how we're going to really help teachers. And underneath all of that, of course, is um, where are we going to get the funding? It's too bad that that is kind of underneath all, but I think we have to go to a break. And I got a so, some answers for you. Some an so. I'm sure you do, okay. and I'm so grateful you're here to do that. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Get your <laughs> your <laughs> you're not f***ing <laughs> in here. Yes, I am. No, no, no. Every day, kids witness bullying. Why are you stabbing me with it? No, no. They want to help, no. but don't know how. Oh, exactly. Teach your kids how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. Congressman, um, what you were just talking about before the break is so important about getting kids to achieve, getting them interested and prepared for the future. And then you mentioned how much we will need to support the students, the schools, and the teachers. But you and I know that in many poverty areas, mm -hmm. uh, the teachers are not always the best qualified, and the materials, the resources are not always there. 
Um, could you speak to that? Because I know you have a heart for this. In fact, if you don't mind me mentioning it, I read in your bio that you and your wife had early on started an after-school program for children <laughs> in a poverty area. So I know you have a heart for this, but how does STEM uh, reach into the, the poverty problem? Um, well, it's a great question, and, and thank you for asking it. The, the fundamental, uh, my fundamental push with STEM education has been trying to make sure that every student out there is able to maximize their potential. Uh, some of the, the jobs that STEM is going to lead to and the opportunities there, we need the most talented people working in those jobs, working in those professions we can get. And that certainly means if we're going to do that, you can't ignore uh, low-income neighborhoods. Uh, STEM fields are traditionally um, those that are, are populated by white men. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with that observation, Senator Christian Gillibrand and I, Senator from New York, filed the STEM Gateways Act. That is actually a, it's a competitive grant program, if we can actually get the legislation passed, that looks at trying to get underserved communities, um, oh. minorities, women, um, lower income uh, areas, uh, engage in STEM education. So it would provide a competitive grant process whereby recipients could come up with a, a, a program to actually find ways to engage some of these underserved populations in STEM fields. And that's the going to the exact insight that you had there. And, and so we're, we're trying to push that through Congress. Um, but mm -hmm. we've got a great partner in Senator Gillibrand and, and look forward to pushing it ahead. Well, thank Thank you. And of course, I grew up in New York, actually, which is, it was the Lower East Side, but now it's um, gentrified, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I couldn't live there now, even on a teacher's <laughs> salary. But I'm so glad that you are keeping the people who don't always have all the advantages in mind. Um, in fact, when you said how important it is to have these skills for apps, I heard uh, Walter Isaacson, the biographer, and he said, everyone should know how to code. I said, oh, I've got to take a course in coding. <laughs> how can you be, you know? So I, I, I think it's great that you're reaching beyond just the white male population in high income uh, areas. Um, one of the goals said that they want to increase students who graduate from a post-secondary institution mm -hmm. with a degree in STEM fields. Now, you didn't say there, it doesn't say a college or a university. Mm -hmm. So does this suggest that you're being very supportive of other institutions like tech schools, community college? And what about the MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses? Mm -hmm. um, what, do, what do they have in mind here when they talk about a, a secondary institution? It's a great question. It's all part MOOCs is the massive open online courses I think are, are part of a, an extraordinarily exciting innovation in higher education. Um, there's some prospect here for uh, MOOCs to play a role. There's also uh, a number of other exciting innovations about um, trying to get this skill set out to a wide variety of, of students where that might not have traditional access uh, to uh, again some of these fields. The idea behind uh, that goal is, yes, working through community colleges, working through vocational schools, looking at uh, uh, programs that will get uh, earn students an associate's degree uh -huh. on their way mm -hmm. to a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, and really, the, the observation here has been trying to, you know, what the second round of the this, uh, STEM report looked to, was really trying to tighten that link to uh, from that skill set that's being taught in our schools, in community colleges, vocational schools, elementary schools, and high schools and colleges and universities to the skill set that employers demand in order to fit right into that workforce. So trying to really tighten that linkage. And so the goal here is to uh, make sure that we're, as we build up these programs, there's strong coordination with employers to make sure that, that those skills are in fact demand driven. Understanding what is it that if you want to be a, a a basic computer programmer. What skills do you actually need mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. order to uh, get right into that job? And let's make sure we're training people uh, through that edu our education system to make sure they've got that, at the very least, that basic qualification. Um, I'm listening very carefully to this, but remember, I told you I was a reading specialist, and my my minor was theater for children, the <laughs> arts. And at that great uh, resource uh, affair that we went to, I was. I had a panel from the uh, Fall River Symphony, from the Arts Association, and I mean New Bedford Symphony, Fall River Arts Association. So of course my mind is going here. We're hearing a lot about um, the commercial world, or the, the world out there, the business world needs all these people. But years ago we used to speak about well-rounded people. So um, in fact, um, Walter Isaacson, I mentioned him a minute ago, from the Aspen Institute, uh, he's written biographies. He, of course, everyone knows about his newest one. They don't remember Benjamin Franklin, but Jobs, mm -hmm. um, anyway, Steve Jobs. And I was listening to him speak, and he was saying that 
The humanities are needed to support it because he said innovation and collaboration take the kinds of things that the arts bring. So in the next few minutes, I wonder if we could talk, and I heard this quote, I don't know if it was from him, computers use algorithm rules. But the brain is not digital or analog. Mm -hmm. Isn't that clever? Yeah. To think about how important are the arts and humanities in connection to STEM? Critically important. Oh, so good. <laughs> the, I think if you think of an iPad, clearly, uh, or an iPhone, or the next great innovation, clearly what goes in, there's a lot of engineering that takes place, uh, a lot of coding that takes place in order to work out the, uh, the, the apps and the computer systems and the engineering in order to create a, a touch screen and everything else that mm. goes into it. The iPad was born of an idea, of creativity, of inspiration. And so uh, I think you can look at engineering as a set of tools to try to solve a problem. The, in order to solve that problem, though, you need to get creative about what is the problem we're trying to si solve, define it, and then use your engineering tools to help make it so. You and have so to have an idea. It's yeah. a, you have to have an idea, and you have to spark that creativity. And I think if you look at some of our greatest inventors, uh, whether uh, and particularly of late, the, they are dreamers that were able to, to, to invent something that solved a problem or created a, a, a vast new marketplace. You mentioned Steve Jobs with an iPod that turned into an iPhone and, and <laughs> iTouch still and changing. iPad and that next round. Right. Um, some of our mm -hmm. greatest mathematicians have also been, um, had a, a, a deep interest in um, music uh, theirs and, and the arts. And so that, um, I think there's an awful lot of overlap. If you go and you speak to or you talk to uh, folks that are really pushing uh, a STEM curriculum and STEM education, if they're doing it right, I think they also recognize that the arts and that creativity, that inspiration that has to be uh, there as well. I don't know if it's true or not, but someone quoted, um, I, I will quote the person, <laughs> said that Einstein said that he got his idea for relativity mm -hmm. while listening to a concert. Now, I don't know if that's true. I'll have to go back and research it. But there, there is such a tremendous connection between people who can think creatively and outside the box, like the people you just mentioned. Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering how the congressional offices, you mentioned your app contest, but how are they supporting all these initiatives, um, not only in Washington, I've heard some from this district, but is there, is there some real um, commitment, some real will to start initiatives? Oh yeah, so absolutely. I mean, one, the, uh, a number of other uh, members of Congress from across the country, Democrat and Republican, have engaged in that app contest. Um, two, you, we're uh, again taking a, uh, as we break down STEM into smaller bite-sized pieces, manufacturing has a big piece to it. Uh, we've got a manufacturing bill that um, we've been working on for o over a year now. Um, we've got over 40 Republican co-sponsors on it. We've got over 40 Democrats, uh, the oh, education. Oh, 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 I have to interrupt you there. You're telling me that you have something and you have both Republicans and we Democrats do. on do. a STEM manufacturing initiative? It's, it, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I think it is a, it's a sign that when you, you look at uh, the, the idea behind this is to create little incubators mm. of new manufacturing technologies around the country. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan support for it. Uh, it's supposed to spur innovation around new manufacturing techniques and, and, and um, tactics. And so uh, education aspect of it, it it's got to be through it, actually done in it through an educational facility. And so that's a, a critically important part to it. Um, we've filed a number of bills, as I mentioned, one with Senator Kristen Gillibrand. We filed another one. Uh, called Educating Tomorrow's Engineers Act that actually looks at some of the science requirements and does some tweaks to uh, federal education guidelines to make sure that we can broaden out um, the requirements of what engineering actually means so that students can get cre course credit underneath federal guidelines. Now, I I'm not quite sure what that means. Could you say, uh, just say a little more about that? So it's a, te it's a technical change mm -hmm. in some of the existing federal guidelines that allows oh, people okay. to get um, for some new courses, okay. uh, the way that they're written uh, wouldn't necessarily qualify them for um, some of their old classifications. If you had to take an education requirement for math or science, some of the new engineering courses wouldn't necessarily fall under that. So this gives the added flexibility to basically make sure that you're um, broadening out uh, your STEM science and technology uh, education requirements. Um, that was filed by Paul Tonko, representative from New York. Um, it's got broad-based support in the House as well. And it sounds to me that that gives, that's opening the door a little wider yeah. to more people who, because some of these courses, 
as you're saying, now will be accredited and they will become acceptable under this guideline. Am I saying yeah, that correctly? Yeah, exactly right. And so yeah. it's trying to update really some of these, uh, these curricula. Mm -hmm. um, you add on top of that a number of members from across the country looking at uh, various initiatives from those uh, MOOCs that you talked about a little bit earlier to newer innovations in uh, educating, or education curriculum such as badges and credentialing um, to do, start to layer certain different types of uh, certifications that, on top of that each other. Inter that interests me very mm -hmm. much because um, very often we have a brand new teacher that has to go through the, the steps and if there is some, you know, there's a layoff, we lose some of those mm -hmm. really excited and knowledgeable new teachers. And then there are people who say they just can't make it yet. Maybe they have a family. So would this help with what you call badges, certificates, uh, whatever? The badges and credentialing idea, the observation behind that is that there's, um, with innovation moving so rapidly, um, there's some skills that are necessary now oh, that okay. don't necessarily require a full associate's degree or college degree. But mm -hmm. then again, some industry standards of saying, you know what, we need somebody that can, knows how to work as a Cisco network. So you could get a Cisco certification to say okay. uh, where I could go through a course, get mm -hmm, that certification, mm -hmm. and now this is something that industry recognizes is to say you've got mm -hmm. that skill set that I need. So This kind of reminds me, excuse me for interrupting, but I was, it makes me think of uh, some of the community colleges where you take just so many uh, years or months to become a phlebotomist, 18 or 20 months, and you can go do that job at the mm -hmm. hospital. Is that the kind of thing? That the idea is yes, so for, uh, again, some of these jobs that are looking for specific uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, skills, skills mm -hmm. uh, and, and classifications, to basically say you might be able to get there much more quickly if you take a certain targeted number of courses or certifications rather than a much longer curriculum. So to get a again, bachelor's or a master's. Let's or get you right back into that workforce. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, this sounds good because people do need many um, doors and avenues into the real world instead of just staying working yeah. at McDonald's, you know, nothing Absolutely. against McDonald's. But um, in, in this whole effort that you've put forth for STEM, what's been your greatest disappointment or frustration and with limited time and or your greatest reason for optimism? Well, I think um, the, uh, the optimism is the students it's by far. The um, students. You've seen, I've gotten to meet students that are literally a high school student that designed his own version of a, a Segway. You get to see kids that are inspired to take on the next great engineering mm -hmm. challenge and that are looking forward to, to solving that next great problem. So that's uh, really the, by far the best part so far. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for being Absolutely. my guest. Thank you. In closing, in seeking to collaborate the humanities, the arts, along with STEM, a former CEO of Lockheed Martin said, and I'm going to read his quote, in my position as CEO of a firm employing over 80,000 engineers, he felt that those who distinguished themselves the most were those who could think broadly and write clearly. I call that comprehensive STEM school talk.